Hey, how are you? Good morning. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Oh, I love your background. I love it. It's gorgeous. Over work here. in progress back there. Yes. I still need to decide what it's color to film. Oh, we're a work in progress. Yeah. Maybe a couple hours left in that to do. That is beautiful. Thank you for giving us a little sneak peek before. So I'm excited to see that when you post it later. Uh, yeah. What are you drinking this morning? What's in your, um, your mug? I'm drinking some cold brew. Um, it's just a, a classic cold brew. I, I, I only do cold brew. Um, and this one is the brand I think is called Grady's. They're out of Brooklyn, New York. Um, and they just sell a cold brew concentrate. And so um, I love their concentrate. I've tried just about every one that you can buy in stores since uh, the pandemic began um, to cut down leaving the house to get coffee. And this is, I think, the best the best one I've found for me, yeah. So cold brew lovers, you got a tip. You got something to look into if you're interested in trying it out. Go try it. You can drink what Patrick Gabaldon drinks. So that's awesome. So we have a lot. I have a lot of questions for you. You are phenomenal. And so I'm very excited to get this started. We have a couple questions already in the chat. So just feel free to, cool. ask, uh, to ask any in the chat. We'll definitely make sure we shoot it out after all the other questions that ha that come through. So he is a UTEP alum. You received your bachelor's in communication and political science, and you're currently an attorney and an artist. So I wanted to ask, how has UTEP prepared you for that journey or for what you're doing now? Yeah, I mean, UTEP prepared me um, greatly. I mean, I took a different path than most that I know who ended up being lawyers um, at UTEP. And I think that unique path helped me be a better attorney. Um, it, you know, I had my struggles when I went to law school in being a, a good law student because I, I just, I wasn't as prepared as, as a lot of other people who, who were ready to go in. But my experiences at UTEP really helped, I think, shape me become a better attorney. And I say that because, you know, the, the faculty, the staff, the student body, everyone was incredibly supportive at UTEP. Um, I didn't know I wanted to be a lawyer at all. It wasn't really in the plans for me um, <laughs> until some faculty and some professors I had really put it in my mind to think about it. Um, I would have never, never thought about it. I was lucky enough to take some, some graduate courses as an undergrad, and those professors were just really encouraging to, to consider graduate school, whatever that might be. And so just the constant encouragement, especially from the Department of Communication, um, just kind of pushing me to try more things or to put myself out there in something that I didn't maybe see myself doing. So UTEP was really instrumental. I mean, that's where I, I met my wife. That's where I met most of my great, my great friends. And, and the, the general culture of community and, and family at UTEP really, really was cemented when I went away to law school and that really didn't exist. Um, but it helped me realize how good it really was at UTEP. Right. And then the few people that were also from El Paso that I met in law school um, helped me get through it as well. But, you know, that health foundation was all was all at UTEP, helping me realize a potential I didn't I didn't see for myself. So I love your bringing back to the community at UTEP and just that culture that we have here. I just it's hard because we're remote right now, but I know a lot of us are still trying to keep that fire alive. And mm -hmm. for those freshmen that just came in, don't give up. We're going to go back soon. And that culture that he's talking about is there. And so I love that you mentioned that, that you take that with you. It's almost something you can mm -hmm. connect with. When you hear people from El Paso, it really like you draw to one another because it's, it's just mm -hmm. you understand. It's almost that understanding. I'm sure that's the same with other cities, but it's just something here is family and home all the time. <laughs> no, no, right. I mean, and, you know, I know a lot of, of a lot of my friends that are attorneys now or that, you know, maybe live in other states and went to other law schools across the country that went to UTEP, share a similar experience, even though our paths might have been different, to get to law school. Like, I didn't do the Law School Preparation Institute, which I know is an amazing program at UTEP. So many of my colleagues and friends went through that program and loved it. But, you know, I, I use it as an example that, you know, you don't have to be in those programs to fulfill, you know, a goal in your mind, right? Like, you can find the support and the the – um, encouragement in a place you might not think you would find it, right? So, like, I didn't find it in the Law School Preparation Institute. I wasn't admitted into that program. I had to kind of find things on my own, but it was still those professors and those people around me that that helped build 
helped build a foundation for me to, to be successful. And you keep touching up on professors and, and, and I feel like some of those, were they mentors to you? Cause I know you said you took some grad schools. Did you have like a little crew of people supporting you from the professor side? Yeah, I did. I, um, you know, I had um, Dr. Witherspoon. I think she might be the Dean. I don't know if she recently retired. I know she was the Dean at one point of the graduate school mm -hmm. at the time when I was there, she was the Dean of the communication department and she really, she really, really encouraged me because I had, I mean, in my head, I had her on this like academic pedestal, right? Yeah. Like she was the head. She was always really concise in her communication. She was always very clear and I just really respected her. So when she started putting it in my ear that, it, that she saw that potentially for me um, and that her husband was an attorney and I just didn't know very many lawyers at all. So it was just extra encouraging. And then when she invited me to take some, some of her graduate courses with small groups, I think she, I don't know why she did it, um, but it did really help me realize like, oh, okay, maybe I, maybe I can do this, right? And then that propelled me to, you know, study harder and get better grades in my, my courses. And she was really instrumental. Dr. Barrera, who was in the communication department, was really instrumental to help me just see new perspectives because I found as life as an attorney, a uh, practicing attorney is it's important to have as many perspectives in life as possible to really better serve your cases and your clients and those around you and kind of practice with some humanity, which in my experience sometimes gets lost in people when they get into, into law school. So. Gosh, it's just the, the, the ability to talk to your professors is super important. And I keep hyping it up all this time. Talk to your professors. They, they can yeah. definitely open no, up. You know, I didn't do it early on, right? Like when I was a freshman and I was in my, you know, whatever that course was like, UTEP, just like the yeah, 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 get the, school, right? the first class that kind of helped you as your advisor and everything. Right. I was super shy. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't speak to my professors. I didn't reach out because um, I was just nervous mm -hmm. um, and uncomfortable. Um, but thankfully, it took having several courses, small classes, you know, which UTEP offered where the professors could get to know me and where I could get to know them. And that's what really allowed me to, you know, just be more confident. Um, Cause I just wasn't a confident student. So. And thank you for sharing that because a lot of students feel at freshman year, you have to be going, going, no, you work up to it. You get that confidence and yeah. then you talk to your professors. Yes. And like you said, I think Ooh. you had those classes with her maybe several times or she was part of maybe your focus of your degree and you're more comfortable because you can relate to them. That's kind of what you're focusing on. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. I love that you mm -hmm. mentioned it's not always starting off. Just no, I mean, I, I had no, no clue. I mean, none whatsoever. One, what I was going to do, what I was going to study. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to take courses that I found interesting and that challenged me. And it was just kind of a, you know, a hodgepodge way of, of getting into these courses where, yeah, my advisors then were like, okay, well, you're taking this theater shop class and you're taking these music classes and you're doing this. Well, how about try something more challenging, right? So I took uh, in, international law and constitutional law and I, I, I wasn't good at them by any means. I didn't get great grades or anything, but I really liked them. Yeah. So that really helped open my, open my mind to what else, you know, what else was out there for me to do. Yeah, getting out of that bubble. I'm glad they recommended mm -hmm. it. I'm so glad. And they saw the potential. So that's that's a big deal when someone sees it in you. So that's beautiful. Yeah. And I so going off of that into the artist part, you're an attorney and an artist, and they kind of interchange with the, your interviews. You're, you say artist, inter attorney. How do you balance mm -hmm. both? And do they ever cross one another? Well, they, they cross one another daily in kind of my mental um, scape and my emotional um, you know, just my emotional well-being. Um, you know, the painting really helps me focus myself, center myself so that I'm better in the courtroom or that I can maybe see different perspectives or, or have the ability to have a little bit more patience in the courtroom and not get so ramped up on the anxieties of trying a case or, or an issue in front of the judge or, or whatever it might be. Um, and then too, like the, one, I really like the law too. You, you can be super creative. There's a million arguments you can make. You know, there's, it's just, it's a, it's also kind of a dance and, and, and fluid. Um, so that's one thing I like about it. And I think the art helps that. And the art, you know, the law obviously helps my art a lot too, because 
um, it's a total switch of my mental thinking when I'm painting versus when I'm in the courtroom. And that total difference, I think, allows me, um, allows me a certain freedom when I'm painting, right? Like the stakes are really low. Um, whereas when I'm at work, the stakes are pretty high, you know, so picking a yellow or figuring out what color background it's going to be is really not that big of a deal to me. And of course it also, it's, it's one of the main reasons I've had, I had success as an artist because I started painting and I would take my paintings that, you know, weren't very good, but you know, they were, I was growing as an artist, hang them up in my office and people would, my fellow colleagues would walk by and they'd like them and they'd buy them from me you know, and it was totally just luck of being in the profession and having friends that support and colleagues that support my art. And that though the first people that bought my artwork were all my friends and colleagues that just, you know, saw them in the office or ran into me in court and saw a picture and said, Hey, I need some art for my office. How can, you know, can I buy it from you? So it's been, you know, they've, they've both really, it's been a dance between the two of them to help. Well, you do it so well. And then the contrast of the differences, like you said, one is high stakes, one is low stakes, that, that, that does have a helpful habit. And I know a lot of people have that artistic mind where they want to pursue it, but they don't want to go to get a degree in it, but you can still do it. And, and that's why, and you're so famous in your art here locally that it's almost, I, I feel like a lot of it um, can counter contradict because you're so heavy in both these elements and it, like how do you deal with that do you ever get tired or you or do you sleep pretty mm. much <laughs> no i get tired all the time it's funny um i find that i really paint more the more stressed out i am um with the case so if i'm in a jury trial that lasts a couple weeks i'll be painting every day after after um the, a day in court mm -hmm. because for me it's like that mental the mental break that sometimes for me, I found that I really need to separate to kind of see new perspectives and to find new ways to work on an issue in court. I find that, and it was the same with me in law school. When I focused too much on an issue, sometimes I got, I would drown in, in the, in the waves, you know, so I need oftentimes to step away. Um, so it, it has really helped me, I think be, be a better lawyer, but it is, it is tough. I mean, there are still many times like where I just won't paint at all um, for a month or two. I, I mean, I love to paint and I'm lucky that people support. So I'm, I'm afforded the opportunity to paint a lot. Um, you know, and I'm just, I'm just really grateful that people like my, my paintings because it means I can just keep trying new stuff. And I'm sure if no one bought them, I mean, I just, I paint over them, you know, and do new, new pieces or I, you know, that's one reason I like to donate a lot is because I paint a lot. So it's nice to be able to find homes for these paintings with local charities to help raise money. Yes. And you can find his artwork everywhere. And you have this gorgeous mural and this is just hyping you up because you are phenomenal at this Thanks. art and you, you're so humble about it. It just, it's just, it, I, I was super nervous meeting you and uh, because you're just you're kind of like a little bit of a famous person in these parts and it's just exciting to know that you're so humble about it and you balance it so well and uh you're just a staple in this city so that's just thank oh, you for thanks. what you do by the way it's just beautiful and i'm just gonna thank stop you. quoting <laughs> so, I appreciate it. yes and this is the actual topic of the whole uh career conversation cafe what does the day of an artist look like for you since since you have both what tell us like just one day yeah, so on the weekends, a lot of it is, um, you know, waking up and, and usually going for a walk in the neighborhood or we like my wife and I like to go up and walk around Utah too. And, and I like to take a lot of pictures. So pretty much every piece you see of mine is a is a photo of an actual can cactus or plant or sunset or whatever. Um, so if it's a painting day, it's usually started with some coffee, a walk in the neighborhood, lots of pictures of Ocotillo and prickly pear and then sketching and moving and, you know, manipulating an image on my iPad to see what might work. And then it's painting all day. Um, you know, my wife and I, we don't have children. We just have some dogs. And so if I get in the mood to paint, yeah, I just set up the easel in the front yard or in the living room where we're maybe watching Netflix and I'm painting all day and I can just literally paint from, you know, I think on Saturday I started painting like at nine and I finished around 1030. 
you know, and I took breaks for lunch and for dinner, but I usually do about 10 to 12 hour days when I'm painting. Um, so it's not that I'm painting like an hour every day. It's usually like nonstop for, yeah, especially when I have three day weekends, it's nonstop from Friday night. It's like, okay, Friday night, I have the <laughs> pencil on canvas and I've kind of laid everything out and composed everything on the canvas. And then Saturday morning, start painting. It was nice when we had nice weather because I was painting a lot in the front yard. Um, so hopefully once the sun picks out over the next couple of days, we'll do that again. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of like a law day, it's like, well, I'll wake up, get my coffee, um, you know, do at work all day and take a break at lunch, uh, watch some YouTube and make a sandwich. And then I usually don't paint at all during the week. Really? Uh, it's very rare. Yeah, it's very rare. May maybe every now and then, like I'll do a little bit of detail work. You know, that I can fit in in an hour during lunch or 45 minutes or whatever to get a little bit of something done. But I'm I'm still not the best at like mixing paint and amounts and, and finding my color, my colors too quick. So I hate throwing paint or wasting paint. So I usually try and make sure I have like a good four or five hours to work um, so I don't have to throw any paint out. Yeah. And that's that's true and I'm, I'm not an artist and i wish i was but th the idea of the color and if you lose that color then it throws off the painting and so getting it done yeah. in one chunk i can understand is i mean you love to do it and that's i love seeing you how passionate you are like i can do it all day and it's just a relaxing thing and just kind of like zoned out in your front yard that's just perfect it just sounds great yeah. if i was an artist it'd be so great but um i know a lot of our students who love art truly want to hear how how do you do it and so you don't do it all yeah. week it's like a one shot and you truly just kind of envelop into it yeah i you know it's my personality type i think i get pretty obsessive over a piece when i start it so i've learned that you know the best way for me is if when i start it i keep working otherwise i just think about it all the time and it's just better if i can kind of get start to finish or maybe get a like for this one get a huge chunk of it done and so now the last bit of it isn't tons of work, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I always tell people, especially, I mean, I consider myself a young artist, not in age, but in terms of creating um, to just keep doing it like every day, do something or every other day, like don't make it a rule that you have to draw something or whatever, but make it an intention in your life to try and create a couple times a week. Um, and I know it's harder if you're like a graphic design student or someone who works in, in advertising, right? You're using a lot of your creative energy in, in work and it might be harder to, to express yourself when you have your free time because you're so just tired of working. Mm -hmm. um, but I found that for me, you know, inspiration comes and goes, but I can always continue to get better or continue to see new things if I'm just constantly thinking about the work, right? Thinking about yeah. composition, thinking about color, staring a little bit longer into the sky or staring a little bit longer at a plant to see the things that I might miss the first time that I might be able to see the next time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I tell people all the time, like, you know, whatever you do work-wise, even if it's not a full-time artist, like the only one who determines if you're a creator is yourself. So if you stop creating, that's fine. And, but know that the minute you start creating again, whether that's dancing or painting or singing or whatever, the minute you start doing it, you are an artist. And the only one that can stop you is you, right? And if the goal is to become better, you don't necessarily need a, a degree or, or um, someone forcing you to do it. You just have to have some kind of inner push. Yes. Propelling you forward. Yes. Thank you. Oh, I'm so happy that you just the, the words you're saying are so inspirational. And uh, I know a lot. I have a friend who's an art teacher, just as you said, like during the day, she does so much art that at the afternoon, she doesn't do her own art. And and she just did a painting recently and she showed it. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And she's like, I haven't done a painting in years. So sometimes it's hard to find that outlet when you're doing it as, a, as, an, as an employment. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely finding it and making fine tuning your voice, whether it be with, again, literally your voice or musical mm -hmm. instrumentation or actual artistry with with designing and and colors and everything so thank you for giving that to our students mm -hmm. they're going to need that little motivation check right now because it's february mm -hmm. and that's great motivation the number of those students too right like when i was at utah the only creating i did was like doing doodles of professors in my books you know <laughs> like 
All my UPEP books, my law books are filled with cartoons helping me remember a topic. Um, yeah, I still see them every now and then that come up in like my Google photos of pictures I took of cartoons I made in law school or at UTEP to help me remember something. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just because you're not creating now or just because, you know, you might say, oh, well, I've been in my career so long. Should I start something new? You know, there's always time to do something you love, right? I mean, you can start by doodling um, or even not do. I mean, there's no, it's never too late to discover something you really are into. And so for me, it was pretty late, right? Like a lot of my contemporaries were doing art at UTEP, you know, we're studying art and been focused on art for so long, but just because I didn't have that degree or that formal education didn't mean I was not allowed to create or didn't mean that there was not a space for me. And so there's a space for others too. Um, so I try and encourage, encourage that if, if you, there's something you like to do, don't tell yourself you can't because you don't have a degree or because whatever, like just do it if it makes you happy. Yes, and thank you. And if you can have two passions, just like he has, he has law and art. You're not, you don't have to focus just on art. You can definitely dabble into other things. So I love that you are a, kind of a double representation of that, that you don't have to have the degree. You can have those two kinds of things and still find the time to do uh, the, the passions that you have. And that's actually right. one of the questions I'm gonna ask later, but I, I know that we have um, a lot of stuff to go through, but there's a couple questions in the chat that I definitely want to make sure we address because I have my questions are going to go on forever. So I'm going to go and scroll up. There was one, uh, a lot of people are waving and saying, um, hi, we have one from Craig Thompson asking for attorneys, your, your business. Are there any, do you guys do internships for students? Do you guys connect with anything when it comes to that? Totally. Um, so I work at the County and we have internship spots open in all departments. So in the public defender's office, if you want to, you know, represent indigent clients in the county attorney's office, if you're interested in like, so the county attorney, I didn't know this when I was a law student even, but they, you know, represent like the, the hospital and they represent the county when they sue the governor or sue the feds or, you know, and they also do juvenile court. They do all sorts of stuff. And then there's the district attorney's office where I work. And we have, I remember most summers, there's usually about six to 10 interns um, high school interns, uh, student interns. I recommend, especially if you're thinking about law, like, you know, I've never heard of any of these local government offices turning someone down that wants an opportunity to learn. Um, we're lucky that the, the kind of generosity that's in the community in general in El Paso extends to the legal community as well. Um, I can speak from personal experience. You know, they're always willing to help and I always tell lawyers too, like, okay, you're a law student. It might be better for you to figure out what you don't want to do yeah. than maybe necessarily figure out what you want to do. So mm -hmm. if you like are thinking, I don't ever want to do criminal law, it might be a good opportunity to work at a public defender's office or at a county attorney or DA's office to really know if, if you won't like it, because you might be really good at it and you might love it. Mm -hmm. um, the same for any other type of law here in El Paso. So like the internship opportunities are immense. Um, I was a nervous law student also and was afraid to apply to places because the law school I went to made it very clear that they were really focused on the top 5% or 10% of grades of students. So the rest of us, like myself, who was just kind of near the bottom, the average person, didn't really get much support. But I found the minute that I started reaching out on my own to different law firms and agencies here in El Paso, it was amazing how open everyone was. So there's tons of opportunities in El Paso. I can tell you every judge in this county, in the city, be more than happy to help a student. I mean, I, get, I tell people all the time when they find out I'm a lawyer and they're maybe thinking about law school, I tell them like, email me. I will give you all the unsolicited advice you can ever want. I will share with you the things that made it difficult for me. I will share with you the things I could, that maybe would make you be successful in law school. Um, because I wish I had somebody mm -hmm. then to really help me. So I'm, I'm always more than happy to help too. So if any students are watching this and they're thinking about law school, just shoot me an email or a direct message and I'll, I'll be more than happy to talk to you. And I appreciate, and I, I know you said, I want to bring it up that sometimes law has a negative connotation that the people mm -hmm. are very, I don't know, just con, what is it? Conservative and negative. Yeah. And no, they're, they're human beings and they have, 
souls. They're not, and they're great. Yeah. People. They want to bring more in. So thank you for letting totally. us know about those. Totally. I mean, you know, like there are so many good people in, in every career that decide to be teachers or decide to work with students or decide to work in admin or whatever. The same that decide to go to law school. It took me a while to find them um, when I was in law school, kind of to find my people. But, you know, those colleagues of mine are now the ones across the state that are doing really good things in their communities. Um, and, you know, it, it takes a certain type of personality to, to be successful, but there isn't one personality that makes an attorney or makes a doctor. I mean, I get told all the time by people, oh, you're not what I, you're not the kind of person I would think would be a lawyer, right? Or you're not the type of person I would think would go to law school. Right. And I tell them, well, don't we need more lawyers like that? Don't we need more people representing clients who aren't that way um, that maybe have a different perspective? I mean, maybe that's why the law community has such a bad history, uh, you know, perspective is because we don't have people in the field that are like that. You know, I always take it as a compliment, like, oh, you're not the kind of person I would think to be a lawyer. It's like, well, what kind of person needs to be? Right? That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Yes. So. And I, I, I like the way that you said, and this goes back to just in the beginning, you took a different route. Sometimes that different route gives you a different perspective in life and allows you to see the profession you're doing from a different light while everybody else mm -hmm. is kind of sometimes in the same, the, sa the same road and you're thinking outside right. the box. So it's right. never wrong. Try a different yeah. route. Yeah, I'm like, we, we need more lawyers from El Paso. We need more yeah. lawyers here practicing that are from here that understand the community here that we need more judges that are all Paso ones. We're really lucky here, but I just, you know, I think there's, we just need more, you know? Um, and I think, you know, going back to UTEP, right? Like having a perspective from being a student at UTEP and graduating from there, mm -hmm. we need more lawyers with that kind of perspective, I think here in the mm -hmm. state. Um, so I'm always willing to encourage somebody to go to law school always. And for the for those who want to connect with him, I am going to put in the LinkedIn com in the comments his LinkedIn account, so you can definitely connect with him on LinkedIn. Uh, we have another question because you're such a professional, and we love it. We're so excited. Do you have any conferences? This is from Ms. Betsy. Any conferences or professional development classes that you do? I don't know either for attorney or art. Well, I do them all the time for for law, right? Like the the state of Texas requires that we do a, a certain amount of continuing legal education, right? Because the law is always changing. Mm -hmm. um, legislature's always writing new laws and the Supreme Court's always deciding new cases both yeah. here in Texas and, and nationally so we're always learning um, and then there's always new aspects of the law right like I took a course the other day because I thought it was interesting on breweries and the law and I was like wow that's a really interesting um, thing to learn about uh, I found myself trying to learn more about art and the law copyright and the law patent street art and the law like stuff that's interesting to me from the artist perspective Mm -hmm. But also my normal boring, like, you know, what's the new law related to double jeopardy and, you know, assaulting <laughs> offenses or whatever. It's like, you know, the boring law stuff. Yeah. Um, but for art, I have yet to, you know, to do anything like that. Mostly my learning, I see Kristen Apodaca just waved. Um, most of my learning and growing as an artist has come from talking to artists like Kristen, um, yeah. picking her brain you know, before COVID at a, at a restaurant or a bar, running into her somewhere and asking her her opinions on color and composition and, and her perspective and talking to, you know, other artists that, that I run into across the city about that. And thankfully the community here in El Paso has been very supportive. Um, you know, when I was very new, I got so much support from Juan Ornelas, who's a, who's a great artist here in El Paso. And he was just over the moon supportive and so I try and embody his his positivity when people reach out to me but the vast majority of my learning has come from just reading and talking and watching documentaries uh, one that's really good on Netflix is called abstract I, I love watching that it's a really beautiful documentary series about different kind of artists abstract so there's one about like a cartoon there's an episode about cartoonist a fashion designer a light designer for like concerts and shows and theater oh, and yeah. an episode on architecture it's just a really beautiful documentary series about design mm -hmm. um but yeah one day i hope to go to like one of those big like art basil uh events or some big art thing but covid kind of put a put a stamp in that we had, my wife and i had plans this year to like 
do some out of town art stuff, you know, because awesome. every time we travel, we go to museums, but we wanted to do a little bit more, you know, mm-hmm. dive kind of inspired by Kristen Apodaca because last uh, 2019, she went to LA and I know she's done some out of town stuff and it was really inspiring to see an El Paso and with a great artistic perspective, um, put herself out there, yeah. you know, into another commu- into a big community like LA, whether, you know, and to know like whether I sell or not sell, the goal is just to be seen. And that was really inspiring. So we're hoping that, that one of these days soon we can, we can start doing that. And I love, I'm going to bring up Kristen again. So just that sometimes people have this perspective of holding everything. I don't want to share because I don't want people to steal it from me. And everybody's yeah. art's different, of course, but definitely talking to other people, expressing and having that community and the art community is always just beautifully supportive and helpful. And uh, not that I know personally, but just from my, the stories I've seen of other artists, they're constantly sharing one another and talking and that's a beautiful community. So don't be, yeah. don't hold on to your art, share it, ask for opinions, ask for comments. Oh, forgive me, I moved it. And yeah. definitely make sure you get out there. So I love that you kept bringing up just talking to people and other artists about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, so totally, wanna... it, yeah. totally. We're a small community here in El Paso. We, we kind of don't have the, the luxury of like pretending we're not all interconnected. We are, especially in the art world. So, yeah. And there's plenty of amazing art, art around town for, for everyone to find something that they love and that can support. And it's all different. Like you're, you yeah. have your own voice in your art and it's, it, everybody has a different piece of art. So I kind of goes into, we were, you were talking about COVID times and mm-hmm. I definitely wanted to ask the, the big question. During COVID times, how have your art and attorney life adjusted? How have you kind of worked with it or maybe some difficulties you found that you can share with the students? Well, I think it's uh, the main difficulty I think is probably experienced by everyone that's that's lucky enough to work from home. Um, it doesn't I don't that doesn't lose sight like the, the how lucky I am um, to do court from Zoom uh, and to do court four or five times a week just on my computer. That's not lost on me how, how lucky that is. Um, but it has allowed for less commuting time less driving time, which means more time at home to chill, um, to kind of decompress, to process, I think, the grief that I would like to forget doesn't exist, but is there just from seeing the the loss every day of what we're experiencing here on the border. Mm-hmm. So art, art has really helped helped me just find some peace, even if the peace is, is not always uh, a constant hum but more a a sudden bang that comes around every now and then um so COVID has affected that in that you know I find myself that I'm I'm able to do a lot more work uh for my job now that I'm working from home just because there's less lawyers walking into a room and saying hey I have a case what do you think and we spend an hour you know talking about some case right that that I'm not involved in but of course we're all as attorneys we're all excited to share our opinion on an issue Mm-hmm. So I'm like, that's one thing that I miss a lot. Um, yeah. I found, you know, it's it's also been hard because the the work day and the the days off blend together, right? Because I'm always at home, so it's hard to I find it hard still to like create that like cut off time of of okay now work is over I'm closing the door because you can see behind me like I have my computer set up here and this is where I do Zoom cord and where I you know I have my emails open and everything. Um, and then behind me is my my studio, you know, where I have all my canvas and paintings that are finished. And I have like my inventory of all my socks and uh, art inventory and all sorts of stuff. So it has been, there have been positives and negatives. Uh, yeah. But the putting down of the commute has been like the biggest one, right? I don't need to get in my car and drive 20 minutes to get home when lunch hits or when the day's over. I can, yeah, just put my shoes on, go sit on the porch and Yes. and just watch the cars drive by and it's just that's been a blessing and I, you mentioned how it's been difficult to separate work and not working or what are any passions yeah. or after or just cutting it off and I think a lot of people were ex- experienced that students had a hard time cutting off school because they're in the same room all the time usually doing everything and having that kind of stopping point so this is when did you feel that you finally got into a good groove uh, after quarantine of okay, this is work, this is, I'm done. Did you ever feel that? Or are you still trying to find that kind of stopping point? 
it ebbs and flows for me. Like there are, I'll go like a month and have really good, you know, separation from work and, and day and off time off. Um, but I do find like, even though I tell myself, Oh, I'm not going to check my emails after six or whatever. I still find my, <laughs> you know, I'll be in bed watching uh, Netflix or whatever, trying to wind down. And I realize, Oh, I'm researching an issue on a case on my iPad and I'm, I'm you know, we're effectively working, right? Like doing research. And I know there are certain jobs they never end. I always tell people like, okay, well, if you don't want homework, don't become a lawyer because you'll have homework the rest of your life just in your career, which is for most careers. You always have homework. You're a teacher, you have lesson plans and you have grading. And this is every career pretty much you have, you have homework on. But mm-hmm. I, I had a good stretch there when the weather was really nice. Um, you know, where it's like, okay, five o'clock hits. 5.15, 5.30, all right, well, let's get our shoes and go for a walk because it's beautiful. And that kind of served as our separating, right? right. Um, but since it's been cold, it's been like, yeah. well, I'm not really going to go anywhere. It's too cold to go anywhere, so. You can take a walk to the couch together. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know. Like one day at a time, one day at a time. That's kind of yeah. how I see it. And we have a question. So if you haven't, he, he sells socks. I love them so much, and they're great. His mm. artwork's on socks. And we have a question in the chat of somewhat to your mm. business and art. Uh, so it says, you mentioned the business aspect of your art. What skills do creative people need to think about if they want to sell their work? So you also are, you have a business. So you're doing three pretty much, art, yeah, business, yeah, yeah. as well as uh, law. Yeah. So what do you think? Um, well, one, I, I'm super, super lucky. Like my wife is very, very smart. She she is very, very well organized. She is the CFO and the CEO of everything Gobble Gum Art. Like, she runs the business aspect. And she likes it. And she's good at it, you know? So, like, the stuff my brain might not – might take a long time to grasp, hers grasps immediately. So that's also not lost on me. Like, it's it's a team effort, 100%. Um, I might have just given up, you know, early on having to deal with kind of the stuff that she's very on top of and deals with. So, one, I always say to, to find help where you can um, – you know, it's, it's doable on your own, um, but it's always better to find, find help, uh, whether that's help with setup or help with this side or the other, but yeah, the business stuff has been tough. I mean, a lot of it was talking to, talking to local artists that I respected. I mean, a lot of my, um, colleagues, I guess now, or, or contemporaries here in El Paso, um, I spent a lot of time reaching out to them and annoying them with questions, you know, like, hey, Kristen, or hey, Los Dos, or hey, Juan, or hey, Gaspar, or any of these local artists that are really um, friendly, asking them, like, well, how do you even know when a piece is done? How do you know when it's good enough to sell? Like, who are the vendors locally that you can trust with quality? Who are the, the... the framers locally that you can trust, you can trust their business practices and trust their work. Um, And it's been a work in progress and learning as we go to find the the vendors we trust, the companies we we trust and are happy to work with. But it, it, it was a lot of Googling, a lot of Googling, Um, you know, realizing that we had to invest in the business to, to have some stability, right? Like Mm -hmm. meeting with an accountant, Uh, meeting with a lawyer, talking about how we, you know, copyright work or trademark work and, and all these things and getting every piece of artwork professionally shot, which is like, man, all that stuff is really expensive and it's not fun. It sucks to do, you know, but it's necessary to set yourself up moving forward Mm -hmm. so that you have a good foundation. Um, And, you know, the goal was always like, the goal of the artwork was always to, to try and spread joy through color, whether that means just posting lots on Instagram or um, selling work. And I know a lot of artists, like one of my favorite artists ever around Zeke Benya, who's from the area. Um, I can't remember. I think he might've done some, you know, took some classes at UTEP. I can't remember where he went to school. Um, you know, he's said clearly that he doesn't sell. His intention is not to sell work. He does a lot of illustrations in books and, and he's a, a award-winning illustrator and artist for children's books and adult books. I mean, he's amazing. He's like incredible. Um, but you also have to ask yourself too, like, is the point of my creating to sell? Um, I had a conversation early on with a, a well-respected artist here in town 
who who I think had a warped perspective um, because he was like, you can only be a, a decorative artist or a fine artist and you need to figure out which one you are. I, I fundamentally reject that. I think you can be whatever artist you want to be. You can have art hanging in a, in a gallery or a museum and you can also have art hanging on a fridge, like whatever. Is someone looking at it? Are they feeling good when they see it? Then I've, then I've been successful, right? And so like growing the business has all been from things I want to do or things I want to have. I've always wanted colorful socks because I wear, I used to wear suits every day. Yeah. The only chance, yeah, the only chance you got to have any color was in a tie or your socks. Mm -hmm. So it was like, well, how can we, how can we do that? Right. So our business grew in a way that we didn't expect. And now we sell like lots of El Paso themed socks, mostly because I think they're cool and I wanted to wear them. And we're lucky enough that people agreed, right. And, and yeah. people buy them which still blows my mind, like, <laughs> that people buy, buy my so work. It's, it's just crazy, so right? Like, it, it's just because, I mean, I've been drawing on stuff my whole life, and it's just, I could never imagine that someone would want to hang up one of my paintings, um, let alone, like, the hundreds and hundreds I've done. I mean, I think last year I painted, like, 88 original pieces of artwork and paint, and then I created God knows how many digital pieces and I just, I, it still blows my mind. Like when we did that fundraiser over Christmas with the food bank. Yes. We did like a, cause I get commission or requests for commissions all the time for portrait work. Cause I like doing portraits and cartoons on my iPad. It's just a fun thing I like. I'm trying to get better at portraits. And so we decided, you know what, let's do a fundraiser. Let's raise some money for the food bank. There's a lot of food insecurity right now. We'll put it at like 200 bucks a donation, which is high, but we could raise a lot, you know? Um, and if we only get one, well, 200 bucks is like, a, you know, 80 meals or something for the food bank. That's amazing. You got a lot. So we ended up raising like $17,000 <laughs> through the illustrations. I mean, I was drawing like all day, all the time for Christmas I break. Know, I saw, I you know. loved every single picture. Awesome. Um, but it just blew my mind. Like, Every time we got an email from somebody with a receipt, and a lot of people donated a lot more than, than we asked, right? A lot of people donated 500 bucks. A lot of people sent in a portrait for every member of their family. Some, I, I think one family ended up donating like 1200 bucks just of, of, and I illustrated like the grandparents, the mom, the dad, like, and it was just crazy to me. I knew that people would want to give because we wanted to give and we were giving back mm -hmm. too. And we had donated to the food make also, but I was just like, it still blows my mind. Like, I told my wife, I was like, God, thank God we didn't do it for less because my yes. hand would have fallen off. But I can't imagine, I just can't believe how many we did. Like, I can't, I just still don't get it. I'm like, it's just a picture. <laughs> you know? but. Your art makes an impact. And I think that's beautiful to tell students that you can give back to the community with that. Yeah. It's, you're enough and definitely, I love the way that you're saying how you, you you don't understand and how can it be? It's just my art, it's mine. Like this is just what I was mm -hmm. doing for this many years. But that's a lot of students mm -hmm. think and anybody, artists a lot of the time and when they start to just leak out their stuff, it just blows up and that's yeah. just start getting comfortable. And I like how you, you said definitely networking for the businesses. So I'm just gonna kind of recap. Let me know if I missed anything. Speaking with mm -hmm. people and networking on where to start, looking mm -hmm. up for a lawyer, getting all the businesses in check, finding somebody to help you support when it comes to the business side, if you don't feel comfortable with that, and you are so lucky, your wife sounds awesome to be able to mm -hmm. do all that and help you out with that. And then, oh, what else am I missing? So the networking, oh, and then uh, definitely just keep going painting. And we started talking about how phenomenal and looking for fundraisers, looking for opportunities to give back to the community and, and yeah. grow. Oh, and we too, like I tell um, artists starting out or maybe just dipping their toes and like selling their work, Local charities will always take pieces to help raise money, always. And like one of the main re one of the main ways that I guess people started knowing my name and my artwork was directly from charitable giving. Um, that wasn't the intention. Yeah. The intention was like, hey, they're asking, and we have work. Like, why not just let them raise some money? Like, it, you know, cool it's we can we can partner that way um but you know it would it's just the truth is also like when i donated the pieces 
and all of a sudden they're at an auction or something, you're just going to have more people see it. Um, and your name's going to be out there. And it's, it's another good way to meet artists too, because all of a sudden you're, you're at an event maybe pre COVID, um, that you can now run into the artists that you're a huge fan of, right? Like that's how we met the Los Dos. And that's how we, I've met a lot of my favorite artists is from, you know, being in a show with them or being in an auction with them. Mm -hmm. So that's one way I think too, that hopefully that would make you as a person feel a little bit less nervous. When we did our first show, we set up at a Christmas market and we spent all this money making prints and I painted all these paintings and, we bought some tables and tablecloths and we had everything set up and we had to have a kind of heart to heart, like, Hey, we probably won't sell anything yeah. and we need to be okay with that. And the truth is, and it was hard. I mean, it was really hard to get over. Um, the truth is maybe just people won't like it and we have to be okay with that. Um, so we were totally prepared that we were going to come back home with everything. And we didn't, we were lucky, right? Like we were lucky that people saw it and liked it and we sold a lot. But the reality is like, you got to be prepared for that too. Um, the rejection, yep. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question from Nico Silva and says, how yeah. many hours a day or week do you dedicate to art? I know you said that you don't during do the weekday. So it's a lot of the weekend, just depending on maybe what you choose right. to draw. Right. Like I say, yeah, it really depends. Like, the last three day weekend, I think I did, yeah, 10 hours on Saturday, 10 hours on Sunday, and probably like eight hours on Monday. Um, and I haven't painted at all this week, you know. What about um, the one behind you? Is that the one you started this weekend? Yeah, I started this weekend. Yeah, so this is the one that I started on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Um and I'll probably finish it, yeah, on Saturday. My guess is probably I'll probably start working around noon to finish it Saturday. Um, but so it really it really ebbs and flows. But three day weekends are like my time to just kind of lock down and paint. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. have the time. I have a couple of people saying they bought the socks. I have someone saying thank you for acknowledging teachers uh, because they do have those work days where they take homework home. That's another profession oh. where you got to think about that. So thank you for bringing that up. I have several other questions. Uh, which artist inspires your work? I know it's getting to that hour mark. We have about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take too much of your time, but just a few more little questions from the audience. Which artists inspire you? I know you mentioned several already. Yeah, so like the artists that inspire me, inspire me for different reasons, not necessarily because of their, their, their work. A lot of them because of their work, but like one of my favorite artists is Kadir Nelson. Um, he paints these amazingly beautiful portraits of, of African-Americans and black culture here in America. I mean, he's just, he's amazing. I mean, he's amazing. Um, Kadir Nelson. Um, okay. lo I love Zeke Benya, who's, who's a local artist here who does like illustration because I love illustration. My, my love of art started with just illustrations in children's books and, yeah. and illustrations in video games. So that's where I really found my very first love of, of art. I love Kristen Apodaca. Um, she inspires me a lot because of her, her tenacity to continue to push and continue to just try new things, which is inspiring, right? Um, and then too, I'm also large, hugely inspired by Cruz Ortiz and his wife, Olivia. They're from San Antonio. Um, we've, I've been lucky enough to meet them and talk with them and and they're just a, a duo that's really inspiring because they focus so much of their business on community engagement and giving back and putting their name on causes and issues that are important to them. And so having conversations with them and seeing what they do constantly has inspired me to, to do more of that. Um, mm -hmm. And I love his style. It's so unique. And my style is nothing like his, but I'm very inspired by him because he – he is 100% his work, whether he's doing a little sketch or a giant huge piece that's in Louvre or in, in the Mexico City Art Museum or here at the El Paso Museum of Art where he had a show. Um, it's, it's him, and he's not going to apologize for his lack of color or his use of color or the way he chooses to, to compose a piece or have it, uh, the composition of a piece or the size. He's just like, look, this is my art, period. And it's not for everybody. And if you don't like it, that's fine. I hope you find something you like. And that's really inspired me 
as a new artist to like when I create and paint sometimes I'm like oh, is that just is that line too weird is that not is that shape too off is it just not clean enough I'm like you know what that's what it is yeah um, that's who, that's who I am yeah I'm cruising the living room, relocating to Houston so we'll see that to me they're like the Texas royalty of of ah! art okay mm. definitely gonna look them they're up the so. people yeah they're the nicest people and I love 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 Cruz's work um and yeah and it's for sharing names because a lot of people want to follow other artists and see what they're up to and so mm -hmm. definitely going to jump on board and see what I can follow from what you've recommended uh and yeah, I, and I, 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 agree. I was gonna go say ahead. I saw people talking about the socks too if you just follow me on Instagram and go to my website we have like a bunch of sock designs um yeah they're they're we work with a company in Austin um and it was funny, one of their sales reps, is, she's from El Paso, and she reached out to us and was like, hey, I love your art. I'm a huge fan. I work for this sock company. Um, everything is sourced in the United States. What, we think your art would look cool on socks. Um, you want to work together? And it was like, I've been looking into socks for years, but I didn't want to, I just didn't want to go through, through international ordering. And I know it's cheaper, but our intention was like, we want to spend our money locally, as local as we can. Right. Their farmers are in Southeast the southeastern United States, they get all their cotton, their textile farms in North Carolina, and then their design team is in Austin. So like every year now for the past three years, we've done four socks. Um, and so we just launched a sock like last week uh, yeah. with the poppies on it. And it's mostly like, we don't order too many, they're limited, um, but they're just so fun, fun to do. I mean, mm -hmm. I just, I love, I love colorful socks. So. Oh, and everybody in the chat, whoever's bought in socks loves it and someone's looking. So just click his name and they'll take you to his page. You can click on his bio and it'll take you to his store. Mm -hmm. And one more thing I want to hype up is that he has a Ooh. book called Desert Blue uh, that is mm -hmm. of his art. It's, it's, do you want to talk a little bit about that and how you... Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, so Desert Blue was a book inspired immediately after the tragedy here in El Paso on August 3rd. Um, it was written like and illustrated within three, four hours. Um, it was done really quickly because um, I kind of had an intention in my head anyways. You know, one of my favorite classes at UTEP was children's lit. And one of the final projects was doing a children's book. And I loved that experience because I love children's books. Um, whenever we go to a museum and I'm in the gift shop, I'm always flipping through children's books to get inspiration from just the children's book illustrators are, I think, some of the best in the world. Um, and so I wanted to make one of my own that promoted the community here in El Paso. It's a real simple story. It's, it's not complex. It's more a poem about a, a plant growing um, in the desert just to represent, you know, the people here in El Paso. And that one person asked to why I paint so many prickly pears, so many tunas. It's really the same reason I'm inspired by their constant um, perseverance and their ability to grow in the harshest conditions. And to me, it's a reflection of the people here on the border. We strive, we, we grow, we create, we're beautiful, yet, you know, if you're a thousand miles above in the air, you're just going to see a brown mountain. But the truth is, if you look closer, you'll see the beauty, you'll see the color, you'll see the intricacies and the uniqueness of the people here and also of the plants that are, are all around us. And that book is kind of a tribute to, to just the people of the border um, and to our community. Often so many people write the narrative of what El Paso and what the border is for us. So I, I always try and make it an opportunity to to try and so we should be the ones developing our own narrative and so the book yes. is kind of a small part of that and that's it is for sale and it's something that for your kids especially your your raising children here in el paso it's something to start to just give a little inspiration to have that el paso pride which is something i know you advocate a lot for mm -hmm. and just and you came back to el paso to to study to do law here practice right. law forgive me, as well as your art so Thank you so much. I know there's more questions. There's a lot of people saying thank you and they they love you. I'm sure I'm hoping you guys follow. He is phenomenal. UTEP alumni. We have Patrick Abaldon, who is attorney as well as artist. Yes, UTEP minors. <laughs> thank you so much for stopping by and hanging out with us for a little bit and sharing yeah, your course. amazing ideas. Of course, no, thanks for having me. It was fun. Um, I look forward to maybe speaking again as, as okay. you know, I love to talk. That's my career now, so. <laughs> Um, so anytime, just let me know and, and I'm here. Yes, sir. Oh, we will. Trust me. We, we really appreciate you coming in. I hope this is great tips for their students. We're going to be posting this later on YouTube as well as on our page. 
Uh, we're going to tag him in it. So definitely make sure you follow him uh, and any artists that he recommends or follow all his artists. It's just fantastic work. So thank you so much again. Have a beautiful weekend. Hope you get some art done and we'll talk later. Yeah, take care. Adios, y'all. Bye, guys. Thank you.